Director General Gebrensis, Minister Helbock, Ms. Lajsmuls, dear colleagues and friends, it is my great pleasure to open this spectacular exhibition showcasing works and initiatives from across the whole artistic spectrum. I would like sincerely to thank Director General Gabriel, the World Health Organization, and their many partners for organizing this outstanding event. In fact, this is the fourth time that the World Health Organization has organized an event through our cultural activities program. Thank you for continuously enriching this popular forum for cultural diplomacy here in the United Nations Geneva. Art has the power to connect and unite people. It allows us to express ideas and ideals about our common humanity and inspires us to be more proactive in the face of our shared destiny. As demonstrated by many of the artworks here today, art can also play a crucial role in promoting good health and well-being. This is particularly important today as the international community addresses numerous health challenges triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic. The World Health Organization has taken a leading role in researching the critical link between health and the arts. In 2019, the organization released a groundbreaking report on the role of arts in improving health and well-being. It is based on evidence from over 900 global publications and is the most comprehensive review to date. The United Nations also recognizes the importance of art in achieving SDG 3 on good health and well-being, as well as across all 17 sustainable development goals. In addition, World Art Day on 15th of April, which was proclaimed by UNESCO in 2019, is an opportunity to reinforce the intrinsic link between art and society. It is an occasion to highlight the contribution of artists to sustainable development and to use art as a vehicle to promote the work of the United Nations and its partners. I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers of this event for reminding us all of the power of art and creativity and for treating us today to an impressive artistic display in the service of health and well-being. I also wish you all productive deliberations at the round table on how art can contribute to healthy societies resilient to major crises like the COVID-19 pandemic. The engagement of many distinguished speakers from various walks of life is a promise of a meaningful and interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Yes, and I will continue, in fact, with uh, the quote of um, Dr. Tedros Adamo Ghebreyus, our uh, Director General of the World Health Organization. As a science-based organization, WHO puts a lot of emphasis on evidence and data, as you know. Uh, at the same time, we must acknowledge that art has the power to inspire and communicate in ways that guideline, graph and chart don't. To achieve our goals, we must use every tool at our disposal to change behaviors and drive impact. And uh, I will continue to... Um, to um, with, with, with uh, you know, the the big um, pleasure I have uh, to be with you today. And uh, for me, it is an honor to present this uh, art exhibit called Versus. With your presence, your passion, your commitment to promote and move together the importance of art, 
to reach and maintain well-being in our life course. All of you are the expression of this bridge between art and science. You are, for the majority uh, of you, uh, initiative leaders to support local communities, marginalized and vulnerable people. First, I would like to thank my dedicated partner for the setup of this exhibit, the Knowledge and Learning Commons um, Department from UN Geneva Library and Archive. And thank you so much for, uh, for this um, amazing work together. I would like to uh, thank uh, Ashoka Fellow and specifically um, Howard Weinstein and uh, Luisa Barreto. She, unfortunately, they are not able uh, to be here because they are uh, based uh, in Brazil and, and Canada, but uh, they have uh, been uh, exceptional um, people, you know, for uh, to, to make uh, this art exhibit um, alive. And everything uh, was possible with their uh, full support. This year has been an important turning point with the incredible and dedicated support of the um, World Health Innovation Summit, uh, and as well with uh, UNGSII and the National Academy for Social um, Prescribing based in UK. And uh, I thank them for their exceptional, um, authentic uh, leader uh, and, and to have been able to launch together the Global Alliance for Social Prescribing an effective mechanism to support people, not just medically, but socially and specifically with art expression in the center of health facilities and services. This art exhibit is expressing the spirit of social prescribing through the voice and visibility of more than 60 standalone artists from over the world and with different backgrounds and health conditions incredible art collective initiative at international and country levels, and the powerful and impactful uh, art fusion mechanism to connect all of us together and initiate the, the joy of co-creation, additionally to collaboration and cooperation. I thank all the artists who have contributed with their beautiful and touching testimonies and artwork. I would like to thank all my partners, specifically from Smile Train, from all the country, from New York, Peru, Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, and, and the others who will follow for, for the scaling up of Art Impact for Health through uh, this incredible process and design of art expression workshops for the children with cleft, their parents, and communities. And I would like to, to thank all uh, our uh, speakers today in the round table. Uh, specifically, I have, uh, I have been able to see uh, their, uh, I would say, long commitment and amazing achievement to make art visible and important at international level. And their incredible knowledge and worldwide views about the profound impact of healing through art and the advancements on research evidence. I have not enough uh, words to share with all of you my profound gratitude today and joy. And I will just finish uh, uh, on, uh, on a quote. Art is the melody of interconnection of soul as one or unity. It can be through a concert, mural painting, song, or any other art expression from the heart and unselfish perspective. Art, it is an invitation to see different perspectives and views from our life and the world around of us. Art is absolutely critical to stimulate the courage inside of us to explore what is our own well-being and how to sustain it for joy and peace for all. Thank you uh, to, to all of you. And uh, now I, um, I will use this uh, opportunity to, um, to do a, a, little, a little bit of break, you know, uh, before, uh, to, before to start the round table panel. And we would like to invite you uh, with a nice demonstration of the 3D printing. It's a special display of this exhibit. And uh, we have Anthony with us. He's a 
it's come from Paris, <laughs> and uh, he will tell uh, tell us more about uh, what we can do uh, and and to to do the demonstration of of the three D printing. And come all together here. <laughs> Un, deux. Hello, everybody. <laughs> it's the uh, first time for me. <laughs> um, I, I need to present you uh, 3D printing in art. Uh, we have a lot of possibility with it, this type of, um, of uh, manufacture uh, machine. Uh, you, if you see, we can, we can um, build some, some hands with a, a mechanical movement. Uh, you can reproduce some uh, some parts, artistic artistic parts, uh, or another parts like that. Uh, you can use this uh, type of machine for uh, uh, use your imagination <laughs> to to uh, to progress uh, in um, with uh, technical and science. Uh, your imagination. Uh, sorry for my English. <laughs> I hope it's uh, it's clear, but uh, it's uh, it should be enough for me. Uh, if we are, if you have a question for technical or or whatever, uh, I stay here. <laughs> hmm? You're welcome, Isabel. Thank you a lot. Ah, the machine is, it produces actually uh, a big one of these parts. So reproduction of uh, of statues, and uh, we have a lot of time. <laughs> but uh, it, when this part was finished, it's something like that. For one part, uh, for one part like that, uh, eight or ten hours, depending uh, the uh, the infill. If you see uh, uh, inside, uh, it's not completely, um, uh, how you say that in English, uh, rempli, plein, full. It's not completely full. And uh, it's depending if you, um, if you use 20, 10%, 5% of uh, infill. And, uh, but for a complete end like that, you, can, you need to wait 10 hours, something like that. If you have uh, a lot of machine, you can uh, print. Uh, we have a lot of material. Um, uh, some plastic, uh, flex plastic. Um, we we can work with um, bronze, cuivre, uh, and some uh, inox, uh, and uh, carbon. We can work on carbon and a lot of other uh, material because it's always in development. Thank you. <laughs>
Yeah. We will uh, ask to our speaker from the round table uh, if they can rejoin their seat. Uh, we, we will continue, you know, later to, to, to look at it and we will start, in fact, the, the roundtable session. Okay, I will request to all our speakers to, uh, to come back. I think you have Mark. And Monica. And uh, to start this uh, fantastic, uh, amazing roundtable, uh, I would like to uh, give the floor, in fact, uh, to Anna Bashia. Um, Bakia, sorry. <laughs> and uh, she's, uh, she's amazing. And uh, she's the founder and director of the Consciousness Institute in Lugano, Switzerland. But she will uh, tell us more about her and uh, the fantastic work she, she's doing. Thank you so much, Anna. Yes, we, we will start with your movie and after you will. Uh, but you, I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you for all the organizers and uh, Isabel Smooth for the invitation to this amazing event here in uh, the United Nations uh, we, we, we Yes, but I would like to, to start with the video which I prepared to present to, to introduce all of my work. The essence of life is embodied within man. And our breathing is not other from the breathing of life. In human history, the great evolutionary steps flourish in synteny with the evolution of the human consciousness that embraces them. And the key to this lies within the coherence of man with the life he embodies, within synteny, within intuition, underlines Anabakya founder of the Consciousness Institute in Lugano, Switzerland, and initiator of the Enin Project. Enin, an intuitive intelligence still unexplored and analogical beyond mere logic, which is enlightening a new epical evolutionary shift. Enin, an intuitive quality that today can bring us to give answers which are coherent not only with the evident needs and questions, but also with the emerging unpredictabilities. And furthermore, through actions which do not ask energy from us, but which offer us energy. Questions, wonder, and inspiration enlighten the man of all times, who never ceases to give shape to unique and transforming perspectives in the human evolution of all ages. From Galileo to Einstein, as in everyday life, answers, visions, and discoveries come to light and transform the life and the relationships of the entire human community. And this is happening even today. But within a new epical shift, which is opening us towards an advanced envisioning, towards an evolved, expanded intuiting. In such context, Today, a new consciousness embraces an extraordinary scientific innovation, that of a young researcher, Alessandro Pasquali, who is bringing to light an outstanding, surprising discovery, an unprecedented input for a new human well-being. We are dealing, Pasquali explains, with an innovative technology, which in this era, called the era of light, will help us reduce the electromagnetic impact on living organisms. A data transmission through light, which will offer unique developments in harmony with the nature of man. 
A society cannot evolve without an evolution of the consciousness of the persons who embody it. Such theme gets particular attention during Annabakia's meetings with Alessandro Pasquale, and they begin to promote this message on the occasion of the 10th edition of One Earth Choir on February 21st, 2021, when Alessandro Pasquale, with the technology he has developed, launches into outer space, riding on light, the music of One Earth Choir, the music symbol of humanity. One Earth Choir, a project by Annabakia. Eight billion different voices on Earth, but one choir, one humanity. We have many native languages, but one only human language. A language that in the One Earth Choir is represented by a music conducted by the scientist Professor Irvin Laszlo and shared every year by millions of participants in more than 70 countries within a global gesture of deep syntony, empathy, coherence, awareness as pillars of a new human culture. Today in the era of light, as Annabakia underlines, riding on light, global evolution is individual evolution. The revolution of an enlightening, innovative technology of communication by light is lit up by the expansion of an enlightened consciousness and of a wise insight, inin. Where a new man, intuitive, integral, coherent, is the potential evolutionary pivot of the entire society. While he gives form to the creation of life, of which he is both creature and creator, and while he brings to light intuitive answers sensitive to the life which we all are yearning for. Thank you, thank you. And um, in such context, my research and my educational project, INI, look at health and well-being and propose to create them through art. The art of life, the poetry of life. For such processes today, Perhaps we don't need the new ideas and new models to substitute to the previous, but a new experience able to remold the world of our interrelation, of our learning, of our, of our understanding. In fact, there is a place where science and its discovery, art and creation, as well as resonance, coherence, synteny, as well as health and well-being meet. They are the same project, process, and we can create them while being able to offer answers and solutions coherent with life. I mean, coherent with the emerging needs, questions, and most of all, coherent with the emerging unpredictabilities, with actions which do not ask energy to us, but give us energy. For such processes, we are called to recognize, first of all, the nature of life, of our life, where the perfect rhythm of our heartbeat is not other than the rhythm of the cosmic motions. And where life is a flow, and Fritjof of Capra, Professor Fritjof of Capra in the 70s, used to write, our life is a flow of infinite possibilities which we are, which are inscribed within us, and which we ourselves can create with a new answer. Every time when we can start a new beginning, a new possibility, new perspectives, new changes. Uh, while the mathematician Edward Lawrence writes, the smallest variation created now here can generate an humongous evolution, revolution on the whole system where everything is interconnected, where everybody is interconnected in our, in our body. For instance, where Dr. Chopper says, where we 
feel anger or fear or joy, our 30 trillions of cells immediately show the molecules expressing our anger, our fear, our joy. And this thing, the same thing happens, the same entanglement, the same interconnection happens in the cosmos, where when a, a particle changes its spin, its, its the sense of its, its rotation, the related particles in, on the other hemisphere, it changes uh, the speed, its spin contemporary. There is no time from where the information passes from here to there. It's no local uh, 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 effect. And notice that mystery, which is the word that our logical thinking is only how the logic mind tries to define the ineffable experience of poetry, of life. And so the question is, what if life, our life, would be only what we think of it? On, would be only how we define it? Where scientists today recognize that the nature of all that exists is vacuum, is consciousness, which manifests itself as a field of waves, of information, of frequencies, a notion of information where we, are, where we are immersed, of which we are made. And we can perceive, perceive such information. And when we perceive the, them, we, we used to say, something has brought me, has suggested me, and told, has told me to start a new program, to begin something new. And we can just Imagine, for an example, that in our daily navigation, in our daily surfing, in our daily pathway, where we, in general, uh, establish a, a starting point of ours and establish a course, establish our goals, in our daily surfing, we can be reached by the winds of emerging events, and we are requested to follow the unpredictabilities without knowing knowing often one instant before what we have to do one instant later later and we often are requested to change direction direction of our programs but intuition notice notice intuition is able to recognize how the emerging unpredictabilities perfect orient us not only toward our defined predefined goals but orient us to create our own pathway. And, or, and we are oriented to express our own attitudes for which we are born. And our intuition and insights are able to recognize how much our thinking and conceiving and ideas and models are able to influence the emerging events. But today on the forefront of physics, Paolo Renati, the physicist, Dr. Paolo Nati, according with the quantum physics theories, writes, a true knowledge is not that of rational detachment, where our experiences are translated into models, but the true knowledge is that of sharing and comparticipation of synchrony, of resonance, of intuition, which, where we can experience what measure and measurement and models can never deliver. So in our daily surfing, the feel of the ocean or the ocean of the infinite information of which we are made, where we are immersed, of which we are made, constantly informs our intuitive antenna and our intu intuitive self insights. And we are informed by life through symptoms through resonance to intuition, and we can give form. We receive information and we transform it. We give form to it, to something which didn't exist before, to a change with actions which do not ask energy to us, but which give energy to us and which generate resonances new discoveries, new perspective. And this is the place where art, the science, and creation will be in meet. 
um, uh, Brandes, the, the, the grander scientists from Galileo to Gelman argue intuitive certainty, certainty constitutes the more fundamental form of knowledge which engenders the all subsequent rational investigation. And Peter Merritt, chief innovation officer of the Buick, uh, Ubiquity University in California, says, life flows through me when he speaks about intuitive processes. Life flows in through me rather than me run my life. It does not feel like me doing something, but rather it being doing through me. And in the German language, there is a fantastic and uh, sentence full of poetry which says, es atmet me, which means life is breathing me. And Peter Mary writes about, about this, there are all sorts of things going on that we can't know, that we cannot know about, but information is there in the informational fields. So what we what feels right to do next is what needs to happen, happen in the context of the bigger all of life. So in such sense, our inning, intuitive intelligence, educational programs and created by the Consciousness Institute in Lugano, Switzerland, which we have founded with the architect Roman Casaferri, which is here even. Our, we suggest and propose that our current epochal evolution is a radical shift from logic thinking into an unexplored analogical intuitive consciousness within our daily art of change, where we are oriented to give voice to answers in synchrony with the life which we are, where we are created by resonance, intuitions and coherence, and we can create synchrony, health and shared well-being for the life which we all are yearning for. Thank you. Thank you, Anya, Anna, for this uh, amazing uh, uh, and very touching, uh, um, you know, presentation you, are, you have done. Uh, thank you again. Uh, I, um, I would like to uh, now um, give the floor to James Sanderson. He's a chief executive from National Academy, Academy sorry, for Social Prescribing. And uh, I am so happy uh, he can be with us. And uh, the floor is yours, James. Thank you very much, Isabel. Um, bon air midi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon at this really important event. And I'd like to commend Isabel and colleagues on the creation of such a wonderful exhibition that is really bringing the power of art um, to everybody's attention. I think also the lineup of amazing speakers and hearing just now from Anna and really looking forward to hearing all of the other international speakers um, this afternoon demonstrates uh, what a power art has to unite, bring together people from across the world who all share this commitment to enabling art to influence how we live our lives. I'll try my best to set a bit of context around why art is important in the context um, of health and well-being. Modern medicine is, of course, brilliant. I think it's one of humanity's greatest achievements. And no greater example of that um, is shown by the uh, pursuit of a vaccine and the rollout of a vaccine um, against COVID-19 that we're seeing now across the world. And I want to congratulate people working in health and science all across the globe in their efforts over the past um, year or so in tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. But actually, we know that um, what goes on in our hospitals, what goes on in healthcare settings across the world, is not actually what makes us well. What makes us well is the environment around us. What makes us well are the demographic factors that influence our lives. 
And we're also seeing across the world the limitations in biomedicine as well. We, we're seeing that through the issues that we face in relation to opiate addiction and the issues that we face regarding antimicrobial resistance. So we need different solutions in the modern age. We need different solutions that are going to enable citizens to live the lives that they want to live and enable people to achieve good health and well-being. Here in the United Kingdom, we see that at least one in five GP appointments are purely for a non-medical need. Uh, people are visiting their GP because of loneliness, because of social isolation, uh, because of debt, because of housing issues, because of relationship issues. And actually, um, over-medicalizing the solution to that, providing a biomedical solution is not right. What we need to embrace is ways of connecting people to society, connecting them to their communities, finding things that are going to enable them to live their best life. So in England, we're rolling out social prescribing now across the whole of the country. We have over 1800 link workers who work in general practice to connect people to their communities. And over the past year, we've seen around half a million people benefit from the practice of social prescribing. And this has been championed by Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, Matt Hancock, who also um, created the idea for the National Academy for Social Prescribing, an institution that could champion social prescribing in the UK, that could bring together partners, that could improve the activities that people are undertaking and create the opportunity for health to be developed in communities. So social prescribing works on the basis of asking people what matters to them finding out the things in life that are going to inspire them, that are going to help them connect with society. Now, whether or not that's um, things in the natural environment, whether that's exercise and sport, whether it's knowledge and information, or whether it's the art and culture, which is what we're here to discuss today. And what we're finding is many, many people are engaging in artistic activities to improve their mental health and physical health and well-being. People are taking part in dance for health. People are taking part in music for dementia, singing in choirs, and people are taking part in visual art activities as well. The evidence is really clear. Um, the WHO produced evidence on the impact of health and uh, of art on people's health and well-being. And actually, you know, the definition of health is not just about the things um, that uh, affect. Um, as physically, it's a much wider definition. So what we're seeing is the opportunity to connect people to um, art in their communities. And you'll hear um, shortly from Alex Brearley from the South Bank Centre, who will talk about an amazing initiative called Art by Post. We're also hoping through our partnership with the WHIS, the UNGSII, um, the UN and WHO, to be working through the Global Social Prescribing Alliance. And Gareth Presh will talk a little bit more about this shortly in terms of the way in which we want to bring together partners from across the world, all championing this movement um, to enable art to be a fundamental part of health and wellbeing. I think we've got an opportunity between us to create a revolution in the way in which we see health, to create an opportunity to bring artists together with clinicians across the world and a new era in which social prescribing becomes a currency for health and well-being. This exhibition creates the impetus for a new conversation. It creates an opportunity to bring together people from across the world, all championing this movement and thinking about the way in which we use art to enable people to live their best life. So thank you very much, Isabel, Thank you to colleagues. Congratulations on this fantastic venture. Thank you uh, so much, uh, James. Uh, I have no better words, in fact, to, to specifically your uh, final words, uh, you know, resume so well uh, where we are together now. And uh, unfortunately, uh, one of our speakers was not able to join us physically, but she uh, gave me the, the speech of her. OK, I will um, read it. It's um, a short presentation of Adelina von Furstenberg, 
she's president of Art for the World NG, uh, NGO associated with the UNDPI, founded in Geneva in uh, 1995 during the 50, uh, 15th anniversary of the United Nations and fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science. Lady and gentlemen, in bringing you the greetings of the president of World Academy of Art and Science, Mr. Gary Jacobs, and of its vice president, Mr. Donato Kiniger, I apologize for not being able to be here in person with you. In few words, I would like to express here the concern of art for the world on the issue between art and science and medicine in particular. Health is a concern of everybody and is a social responsibility. Art plays a central role in expressing its encounter with health. The artist, like everyone else, have experimented episodes of ill health and with their creation. They are able to provide us a human dimension to the understanding of physical and mental health, disease and their consequence. Art is another means of reminding the community that health is a unique asset, an integral component of the state of well-being that is the final goal of all development. In 1998, to celebrate its 50th anniversary, World Health Organization has opened its doors to major contemporary artists, as well young talents, with the title The Age of Awareness. The exhibition, curated by Art for the World, was composed by more than 40 artists coming from different parts of the world. Large works of art were displayed in the garden and the building of the WMO Geneva. Then in collaboration with the WHO Regional Office, the show traveled to New York at the UN Visitors Lobby and to MoMA PS1, as well was presented in the large space of the SSC Pompeia in Sao Paulo. In 1999, the age of awareness was displayed in the permise of La Laticala Academy in New Delhi and at the Triennale of Milan. The artwork were inspired by the main health issues of, two, of this um, year, such as of course, IEDS, the persistence of malnutrition, the high mortality and morbidity, the re-emergence of certain infectious diseases, and the, viola the viola violation sorry, of the health rights, among others. Mankind has always known that perfection does not exist in this world, and that each new situation brings new difficulties we, which must be dealt with in appropriate manner. Also, health is an ideal of perfection in medicine, just as beauty in art, health and beauty exist only in imperfect way, and no single model can be imposed in the name of an absolute ideal. Between the ideal and reality lies the act of doing which is a characteristic of all the arts. As an ancient text of the school of Hippocrates put it, he who knows that right and wrong don't exist, but that there is a sphere of doing which encompass the two will never again leave the reels of art. Art is not just a matter of beauty, but shields light on disturbing problems which are of, often difficult to interpret, classify, and resolve. Medicine, too, is an, is an art within which scientific progress, new technologies, and new methods of treatments are faced with the challenge of an ever-changing re reality, requiring from the scientist an ever-renewed sense of awareness 
which mobilize creativity and inventiveness. In the recent years, Art of the World curatorial projects are inspired by the UN Sustainable Development Goals, in particular with the question of environment, nature and climate change. I believe strongly that art in crying out against violation of the source that have nourished humanity for thousands of years can raise awareness as much, for example, as the, all the international conference on environment and climate, and climate change, habitat destruction like deforestation and agricultural development on wildland, among other disasters, are increasingly forcing disease-carrying wild animals closer to humans, allowing new strains of infection disease to thrive. Scientists say that coronavirus is the most recent instance of how human degradation of wildlife habitats is linked to the spread of this pandemic. Now, if by nature we don't mean only the landscape, tree and animals, but also the body of memories, desire and inspirations that shape human consciousness and create image, then we can say that the deterioration and the pollution of our environment, the global warming and climate change, impoverish also our imagination and pollute our soul. Therefore, as a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science and Art for the World, I deeply recommend to the artists and scientists to continue to develop collaborations together in order to increase awareness that physical and mental health is one of the basic rights of all persons, irrespective of their origin, belief, or economic or social condition. Thank you so much from, from her. <laughs> And now I would like to give the floor to uh, my dear uh, colleague Gareth Presch. He's the founder and the CEO of the World Health Innovation Summit, SDG3, and uh, uh, much more than that. But I will give the floor to Gareth to present uh, himself and to uh, tell us, you know, about uh, what what they are doing. Thank you, Gareth. Thanks, Isabel. Um, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you from Cumbria. Um, as you can probably tell, my uh, accent is uh, originally from Ireland, so I'm originally from Dublin. Um, but it's a real pleasure to join you and um, to discuss the opportunities around the arts. And really, my question to everyone on the panel and to those tuning in is, what role can the arts play in implementing the Sustainable Development Goals, particularly good health and well-being? We've heard from Anna and the Director General um, and James about the importance of the arts and particularly around purpose and the future. And it all it's all connected. Everything is interconnected around good health and well-being. Um, so I hope through our work, through our collaborations, we can develop new ways of working. I know Isabel is launching um, her digital platform, but there's so much enthusiasm and opportunity out there around the arts and we've had a difficult period through COVID-19 and then um, can the arts be a catalyst can it be a way forward to bring people back into the into our towns for example can we host cultural events can we bring bring people back in to encourage people to improve their health and well-being so we've a lot of opportunity ahead of ourselves from my perspective and from our perspective working together with James and his team and Isabel and the UNGSII foundation uh, which was the foundation set up to accelerate and implement the SDGs across cities around the world, we see a, a, an enormous opportunity through the arts. And I just wanted to speak um, about a, an artist who's actually uh, ex exhibiting uh, at the moment in, in Geneva, um, a local artist here, Danny Ibbotson, who sent a piece across to Geneva. And he spoke to me this morning about um, you know, how art uh, helps his uh, emotional and physical well-being, and there's a clear link, um, you know, from mental health to be made there by expression of arts. And I think we Anna expressed it earlier about the knowledge and the wisdom opportunities and the information um, that is available. And we have, and we understand um, uh, that we have this opportunity to create new um, and meaningful jobs in the future. What sort of society do we want to live in? 
Um, you know, as part of our work, our role is to implement SDGs across cities. And we're working closely with James, the National Academy of Social Prescribing. As you mentioned, the Global Social Prescribing Alliance is really focused around SDG uh, 17 partnership for the goals. And what we want to do is bring that evidence forward to policymakers, decision makers. We recently spoke at the G20 Global Solutions event about how we could frame strategies and investments into this area. I think this is another opportunity for this group and um, for the panelists to look at how can we put our collective wisdom together to generate that value, to create new business models around the arts. How can we demonstrate that value? If we look at, uh, shall we say, prevention, only four to six percent of a twelve trillion dollar industry, which is health and well-being across the wellness sector, across good health and well-being. How do we mobilize that capital and that, those revenue streams into the arts for good health and well-being? These are enormous opportunities of the future. And um, I just wanted to say that it's been a pleasure working with Isabel over the last few years. And um, I know this is the second event that we've been involved in at Geneva. And I want to wish everyone, uh, you know, all the success in the future. And I very much look forward to working together with everyone uh, in the coming months so that we can deliver SDG3 good health and well-being. So thanks, Isabel. Thank you to you. Thank you so much, uh, Garrett, for uh, this fantastic uh, resume of uh, this amazing collaboration. You know, I've uh, I've started for uh, some years ago, and and uh, now uh, we can see the, the scale up together. And uh, now I, I would like to give uh, the floor to um, Alexandra Birle. I hope I I uh, say well the the name. <laughs> It's a director of creative learning from South Bank Center. Thank you so much, Alexandra, to be with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Thank you ever so much. Uh, I have a presentation which I hope um, will be shortly on everyone's screens. Um, let me know, looks like it's loading. So brilliant, thank you. Um, yes, uh, good afternoon. It is, it's great to be with you all and many thanks for inviting me to speak. Uh, my name is Alexandra Brierley, Director of Creative Learning at the South Bank Centre in London. And I'm here to talk about our project, Art by Post, uh, featured uh, in the Versus exhibition. Next slide, please. Um, South Bank Centre is the largest arts centre in the UK and one of the nation's top five visitor attractions. Our site consists of three concert halls, the Hayward Gallery, the National Poetry Library, and on average we present over three and a half thousand events a year, hosting 4.4 million visitors. We seek out the world's most exciting artists from household names to fresh new talent and give them space to showcase their best work. Next slide, please. The Creative Learning Department works across five key programme areas, which are Arts and Wellbeing, our schools programme, Emerging Artists and Creatives, Family and Early Years, and uh, uh, programmes across audience development and access. In 2018-19, over 18,500 participants engaged with the Creative Learning Programme. But in March 2020, we shut our doors. And as is the case for many cultural organisations across the world, this was an unprecedented and devastating crisis. We lost millions of pounds overnight, furloughed 85% of our staff, and since then have had to make impossible decisions around uh, staff redundancies, unfortunately. Next slide, please. Simultaneously, however, the impact and essential role of creativity and the arts on people's physical and mental health their sense of well-being has never been more important or necessary. So at the height of the first COVID-19 lockdown in the UK, forged in crisis, Art by Post was created, a direct response to engage those most isolated by social distancing measures, with a particular emphasis on reaching older adults living with dementia and other chronic health conditions. Next slide, please. Art by Post is very simple. 
participants receive free creative booklets through their letterbox or via email every month, encouraging them to be artistic and imaginative, and as a result, become part of the growing Art by Post community. Included in the packs are free post envelopes, encouraging participants to share their artwork and creative responses with the South Bank Centre. Participants can sign up individually or be referred by a friend, a family member or healthcare professional. And organisations can also sign up to receive booklets. Next slide, please. Tackling loneliness and social isolation was already one of South Bank's existing key strategic priorities. Loneliness is considered to be one of the largest health concerns we have. It is likely to increase your risk of death by 26% and considered worse than obesity and as bad for your health as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. We were concerned that the pandemic was very likely to exacerbate the loneliness crisis already affecting 9 million people in the UK. Next slide, please. In addition, there is a significant digital divide in the UK. Many vulnerable and isolated people would not be able to access the digital creative initiatives that had been created by many cultural organisations in response to the pandemic. There are 8 million people in the UK who don't use the internet. 90% of them suffer from other kinds of economic or social disadvantages. They are also more likely to be in the lowest income bracket and often with long-standing health conditions. According to Age UK in 2018, 36%, 4.2 million people aged 65 and above are offline, and over 79% of all digital exclusion is among those aged 65 and over. Art by Post was created to help address this gap. Next slide, please. Our Art by Post community is made up of 4,500 people aged 18 to 103, spanning the UK from Dover to Aberdeen. Many are supported in the project by friends, family members, neighbours and healthcare professionals who are also invited to join in with the activities alongside the participants. Evaluation undertaken after the first phase of the project showed that approximately 60% of those taking part are living alone and 88% are living with one or more long term health condition. Next slide, please. The project is grounded in partnerships. Our strategic partnership with the National Academy for Social Prescribing, along with 13 delivery partners and a further 156 organisations who are, are our referral partners, ranging from care homes, prisons, housing associations and community organisations. Next slide, please. So far, we have sent over 40,000 Art by Post booklets through the post. Next slide, please. And we have received over 600 works of art back. Next slide, please. Each booklet has up to five activities aimed to spark creativity and imagination to promote a sense of connection and community and can be done at home or in a care setting using everyday objects. Next slide, please. We have commissioned artists from across many artistic disciplines and practices and from across the UK. We worked hard to ensure that the artists we worked with were diverse and representative of the communities we sought to reach. Many of them have lived experience of some of the challenges our participants face and were themselves shielding during the pandemic. Next slide, please. We co-commissioned artists with our delivery partners, expanding South Bank's own network of artists and knowledge and many of them co-designed their booklets with members of the Art by Post community, including those living with dementia. In addition to the booklets, we have also held Meet the Artist online workshops for those participants with digital access, as well as sessions for healthcare professionals and participant supporters to provide them with additional tools and confidence to use the booklets in their settings and with their loved ones. Next slide, please. With the support of the National Academy for Social Prescribing and working with curator Priscilla Caton, we are bringing together an extensive exhibition of participants' work that will open at the South Bank Centre in London in September, as well as online. We will aim to honour and celebrate the work of our Art by Post community and provide a platform for their voices to be heard. Next slide, please. 
This will be followed by a tour to up to five other venues across England in the autumn and winter, with a specific emphasis on locations that have been very hard hit by the pandemic, with high case numbers and prolonged periods of localised lockdowns. Next slide, please. Through our partnership with the National Academy of Social Prescribing, we are also able to bring Art by Post's powerful message about the potential role of creativity in people's lives, their health and well-being to billboards and bus stops across the UK. This is art, not advertising. We have commissioned 12 photographers to take doorstep photography of 52 participants from across the UK. Next slide, please. It was incredibly important to us to celebrate our extraordinary community via these powerful and positive portraits. Next slide, please. South Bank and its partners are in the process of deciding what the next stage of Art by Post will be after the exhibition tour has come to an end. We feel that there is an ongoing role beyond the span of this pandemic for a postal creative project that tackles loneliness and isolation, and we will announce details soon. But for now, I will finish with the words of one of our own participants. Since starting the Art by Post and putting words down on paper, especially the poems, it seems to be much easier. You have brought out a part of me that has laid hidden for virtually all my life. So for that alone, I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Alexandra, for for, uh, for this uh, extraordinary presentation and uh, and to see the scale of uh, what you are doing is uh, absolutely uh, amazing, and uh, it's a good example what what we can do, you know, on on, on this field of art. And uh, now I I would like to give the floor to uh, my dear colleague, you know, from Smile Train. Uh, our key colleague, we have started together this amazing adventure, in fact, uh, when we we met in New York. And uh, I would like to uh, introduce to you uh, Pamela Sheran, Vice President, Strategic Programs and Partnership from Smile Train. Thank you so much, Pamela, to be uh, with us today. It's such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabel. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all. I wish I was there in person, and I hope that next time we all come together to share the incredible story of art and the power of art that I can be physically with you um, all. But thank you for this opportunity to connect virtually. The team has been incredible. So, as mentioned, my name is Pamela Sheeran, and I represent Smile Train, a global children's organization focused on empowering local medical professionals to provide surgery and comprehensive clap care for people born with cleft around the world. We're extremely proud to be here to share our experience of working with Isabel Waxmuth and the Art Impact of Her Health Initiative to stand here on the stage next to these incredible organizations. I mean, just listening to the story from South Bank was incredible and I can't wait to hear from the others. We're all here to try and inspire everyone around the world to leverage the incredible power of art to build resilience and healthy communities for the most vulnerable and those most in need worldwide. So a bit more about Clefum Palette, which is Smile Train's main focus. Clefum Palette is, and this is the next slide, please. Thank you for the group helping, thank you. Clefum Palette is one of the most common birth differences worldwide, affecting one out of every 700 healthy babies on average. Children with cleft face many health challenges, first and foremost being their difficulty feeding, thriving, and even surviving in many regions. With or without cleft surgery, Cleft-related challenges can continue as children develop, including those related to oral health, speech, and psychosocial development. These challenges are often compounded by the children's marginalization and lack of access to care, which in turn causes stigma, out-of-pocket expenses, and geographic barriers to access. This next slide, please. This has a tremendous effect on the children's families, in addition to larger community and society, and of course, the children themselves. And there are so many families in need of comprehensive cleft care today. You can see in these images that I'm sharing the soul, how the souls of individuals, of families, of communities can be a fear, appear weakened truly because of the lack of access to care. Next slide, please. Smile Train, the organization I represent, is dedicated to advancing progress towards SDG3, um, just in response to what Gareth was challenging us about, thinking about the sustainable development goals. 
Um, so our dedication to SDG 3 on good health and well being, as well as health for all by reducing barriers to care for individuals and families impacted by cleft liver palate. We know that achieving SDG 3 and achieving health for all means reducing barriers for all, even people beyond cleft. It means whether you focus on clefts or social change or mental health, you're working with a collective system. Smaltrain works to not only support cleft care, but transform systems of care through partnerships with local medical professionals, offering essential training and resources so they can provide comprehensive cleft care for children with clefts in their own communities. This ensures that local medical professionals can stay local, have the resources they need to be local heroes, and build stronger healthcare systems overall. Next slide, please. Smiletron recognize, recognizes and honors the power of art. For individuals with cleft and for their communities that Smiletron supports, art is an important part of psychosocial health. It helps children, families, and even medical professionals share their fears, express their hopes, explore their identities, and build resilience. Through the Art Impact for Health Initiative with Isabel, and now through the immersive exhibit that you're all here with today and the new digital platform, we see clearly how art can build resilience on a global level and how it can unite so many people to achieve a common purpose, to build a resilient global community with the collective to make health for all a reality. As my closing with you all today, I would like to share a brief video, less than a minute, from an important small training partner, medical professional, and artist, Dr. Antonio Zagara. He was with you all when last time you gathered in the same space in October 2020. He explains in this video what happened during Smile Train's Art Impact for Health event that happened in Lima, Peru in March 2020. He is showing a sample of the masks that actually you'll see here at the event. These masks were made by a variety of proven artists to help inspire or motivate the children born with cleft during the Art Impact for Health event. I encourage you to visit the Smile Train section of the exhibit so you can learn more about the specific experience with Lima in Lima and also another one in Colombia, and be inspired to leverage art as a way to build resilience and bring health to all populations in need worldwide. Thank you so much for listening to the following video, also for my, my short speech, and tremendous thanks to Isabel for her leadership, shared joy, and wisdom. So thank you. Please go to the video. The result was incredible because the child concentrate and connect with something higher with, and for me is similar to the meditation. And they manage to forget for a moment the hard path of their life. In addition, parents know and talk about their experience and they are not the only ones who have this problem. My conclusion is that the art should be part of the doctor prescription, not only for, for a child with cliff, for any disease. Thank you so much, uh, Pamela, and as well, uh, Antonio, it's, uh, it's so uh, touching. And, um, and now I, I would like to give the floor to um, Veronica Franklin Gold. Uh, she's, um, she's managing the arts for brain health and the social prescribing as peridiagnostic practices for dementia. Thank you so much, Veronica, to join us on this front table. It's such a pleasure to have uh, you uh, with us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Isabel. What a phenomenal array of speakers. It's been utterly inspirational. I'm Veronica Franklin Gould, founder of Arts for Dementia, the UK charity set up at Cadego to help develop weekly workshops at arts venues to re-energize and inspire people and carers above the strains of early, early stage dementia. Our web directory of arts events for dementia in the community, now also for brain health nationwide, could be adapted for other nations. Dementia is our most feared condition. Over 200,000 people in the UK, 10 million worldwide are diagnosed each year. There is no cure, no vaccination, but from the depths of despair, as you see on this picture here, there is hope. The best way, as Gareth uh, mentioned, to slow the advance of dementia, to preserve brain health, is to take up weekly arts, embracing also nature and sports, 
let's say, activities to revitalize the soul. Diagnosis opens the door to art support for dementia, but that takes months or more, especially with COVID. If you go to your doctor with symptoms of a potential dementia, after tests to eliminate other causes, they ask if you would like a memory assessment. Let's think about that early moment, the onset of symptoms. What goes through your mind, your partner's mind, in the lonely, lonely fear-filled months to diagnosis? Will I fail the test? Is my brain really degenerating? Will people ignore me? Social prescribing can revolutionize, bridge the revolutionize the diagnostic experience, bridge that stress stressful gap and relieve stigma. It's simply a matter of joining the dots. The GP or doctor, when they refer patients to memory assessment, can at the same time refer them to the social prescribing link worker. The link worker enables and indeed empowers patients to choose their arts activity, referring to the Arts for Dementia web directory in which the arts and wellbeing organisations are signposting their events for brain health and dementia. In this World Health Organization decade of healthy ageing, as doctors in developing countries become aware, even without social prescribing, they can advise patients that arts can preserve their brain health. The time is ripe to transform the diagnostic experience. If the diagnosis is not dementia, arts participation will enhance their well-being, whatever their condition. To make activities accessible to people with cognitive challenges, Arts for Dementia and others, Dementia und Art in Cologne, offer dementia awareness training for arts facilitators. Weekly cultural activity, sharing ideas, creating, co-curating, keeps the brain active, preserves identity, nurtures a sense of wonder and resilience for both person and carer. And when diagnosis comes, they can, despite dementia, continue their artistic life in the community for years. Activities to preserve brain health can be found all over the country, all over the world, in community centres, arts hubs, museums, dance, drama companies, orchestra, heritage sites, at Eden Projects in England, Scotland, Australia, Chad, China, Costa Rica, New Zealand, America, the United Arab Emirates. Cross-sector partnerships are key to sustainable arts prescriptions programmes exemplified by the National Academy for Social Prescribing, Thriving Communities, as we heard from James and Gareth. Arts prescription partners for brain health would be the arts, church, ethnic community centre, heritage, or nature site. Universities, arts and medical students to interact with participants for bi-directional benefit, volunteer support, evaluation, and to spread the practice. Trainer in mild cognitive impairment and early stage dementia for arts teams, link workers, and students. The prim local primary care network for participant referral through GP and link worker. A memory assessment service, Social prescribing can be offered earlier in the process. And finally, the local authority. Working together, NASP style, they attract funding. Now for the cost. A year's weekly workshops for eight people with dementia symptoms plus partners costs £16,000. That's £2,000 per person with dementia or £1,000 per participant as these re-energizing activities preserve their health and, re and well-being for some three years post-diagnosis, the cost saving for which we now plan academic study will, I believe, fit the SDG3 return on investment value of £36 per pound invested. The model itself is adaptable for other health needs with appropriate trainer and specialist service. In countries where formal arts are hard to come by, Music and the arts will be part of their culture, their soul. I should like to close with, if you'd like to look at the screen, the picture of Hope, a woman painted in delicate rags by G.F. Watts. Blind, bent double, desperate to make and hear a tiny tinkle of music from the last unbroken string of her lyre. She sits on top of the globe, desperate to make bent double, desperate to make and hear a tiny tinkle of music 
from the last unbroken string of her lyre. Sitting on top of the globe, its lower, lower segment unseen is to inspire the viewer to imagine the greater whole. So there is now hope. Social prescribing can transform diagnostic despair, empower people at the onset of dementia to engage in inspirational activities to revitalize the soul. On behalf of Arts for Dementia, I should be happy to help. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Veronica, for this so uh, touching, uh, you know, words and, and as well this uh, good demonstration how, uh, you know, art is uh, vital, in fact, and uh, again for the whole life course, in fact, of, uh, of uh, each of us. And now I would like to, to give the floor to uh, Judith Marcus. Uh, thank you uh, very much to, to her. And uh, she's in charge of the Art for Social change. Uh, she's from Canada, Vancouver, and uh, I will give you the floor now to Judith uh, to, te to tell us more about this amazing initiative as well. Thank you, Judith, to be with us today. Merci à tous. Uh, greetings from the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people on the west coast of Canada. Um, I work in the field of community engaged art for social change and will describe some of the one of the programs that we are currently operating at our center, uh, which is a Canadian project. Um, but first, at the risk of repeating what others have said, I'd like to provide um, a broader overview, a context for the work that we're all doing. Uh, and uh, I will start by just suggesting that we all share a belief that art making is an essential element for healthy, cohesive and innovative societies, and that a just society recognizes the right of cultural expression in all its forms. Inviting citizens to engage in all aspects of the whole interconnected ecology of the arts. We know that creative expression through art making provides us with new ways of experiencing our lives. These processes open up diverse perspectives, clarify and celebrate our relationships with each other and with the world. When we can share our stories, our visions and realities through all forms of artistic expression, the full spectrum of the ecology of the arts becomes inclusive and cultural democracy becomes possible. We express our own unique identities and voices and these perspectives become part of essential conversations about what matters to us in all our diversity. Our authentic voices must present, must be present in dialogue about where we are headed now, especially now. Artistic and creative expression contributes to well being and mental and physical health, social and environmental justice, addressing cultural division, prejudice, and racism, brings absent voices to the forefront as we recover from current crisis and act for more sustainable futures. Cross sector collaboration is necessary to deepen and sustain the impacts of this work in hospitals schools, homeless shelters, daycare, seniors' homes, prisons, and then the fight for climate justice. Creative expression becomes a way for us to create hope and action for change. Audiences, consumers become participants. Worldwide, this leads to empathy and insight, as well as practical solutions to often complex problems. I'd like to speak very briefly about Community Engaged Art for Social Change, ASC. In this practice, groups of people who may not self-identify as artists co-create art in any of its form about what matters to them. This process is facilitated by a specially trained professional artist who is in service to the community they're working with and often working in partnership 
with local change organizations. I'd like to describe just one of the programs we're doing at our center right now. It's a national mentor which pairs uh, mid-career, sometimes early career, community-engaged artists with senior mentors over a period of six months. And we pair these people with environmental organizations. They're embedded in those organizations to co-create with participants uh, in community uh, six-month projects, which uh, eventually are open to the public. Um, we've been amazed at the take up of this national project. Um, we see a hunger for creation, for expression, uh, especially during the pandemic period um, that has galvanized people to, um, to participate in opportunities where they can actually express what matters to them. Their thinking and feeling, their perspectives about themselves. Augusto Boal says that people are the experts of their own lives. This is a basic principle of this work so that voices can be heard in these incredibly important uh, discussions about where we are and where we're going uh, and how we connect head, heart and hands. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, this has been uh, a, a wonderful opportunity and I look forward to further exchange with you and thank you Isabel for bringing us together. Thank you so much, uh, Judith, for these so inspirational, you know, um, words, and and uh, it's so so touching, uh, you know, uh, from all of you, and uh, uh, such a gratitude for for all this uh, uh, effort, uh, joint effort together. I, I would like to to give now the floor to uh, Larry O'Farrell, and uh, thanks to Judith because. Uh, she was able to introduce Larry to me. He's a professor emeritus uh, from the Queen's University and uh, the board chair, Canadian Network for Art and Learning. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Larry, to be with us uh, today. And uh, I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isabel, for inviting me. To participate, uh, and a thank uh, thanks to Judith who just spoke because she introduced me to to Isabel uh, or us to each other to one another, um, and uh, this is uh, a wonderful. It's wonderful to find myself in the middle of this uh, exciting and uh, vibrant community, which is uh, dedicated to the arts and um, and well being, and uh, my my organization, the Canadian Network. For arts and learning, uh, has been coming to this place over a period of time. We we are not uh, we do not deliver programs directly to uh, to the public, but rather we are an a network of organizations that do so. So uh, we have been. Uh, who, uh, how do I say? How do we get here? We we a couple of years ago we uh, dedicated ourselves as an organization to. The, to UNESCO's um, Seoul Agenda, which has three goals, um, and this uh, this is um, uh, an agenda that was uh, universally um, uh, approved by the uh, UNESCO, by UNESCO General Conference in 2011. Um, and there are three three goals to the Seoul Agenda. One is universal universal access for you children, youth, and lifelong learners. And um, the second goal is that there should be quality in the in the in the in the work that is presented uh, to to these groups. And the third is the application: how to apply arts and learning to or arts education to um, the um, to social causes and and really to help to address some of these serious issues facing the world today. And so. This has brought us to uh, thinking about well-being as the ultimate goal and uh, 
it, it was so exciting to find that to the uh, OAC, OACD um, has um, in, in their um, so they're they're uh, in their estimation in their um, constitution they speak of um, well being as the ultimate goal of education. Well, this makes a lot of sense to us and to me. Um, I, I know that circumstances are different in, in countries all over the world, but in many of our countries, uh, the story of arts and learning has been, and we, by the way, in our organization, we say arts and learning because we want to be sure that we're talking about arts in schools, but also those people who work in communities uh, or in professional arts organizations who are also concerned with learning in, through, and about the arts. So, um, where was I? So, we, so we are then dedicated to the sole agenda and to that third goal in particular. Um, and so we, we, uh, we were also in, in very much influenced by, um, the, um, the idea of prescribing for the arts, so the, the leadership shown in the UK, especially. Um, and so we, we wanted to find a way of working towards this kind of a goal. And if you look at the history of arts in schools for the last more than 100 years, so sort of for from about the late 1800s until the late 1900s, uh, actually, um, education was governed by um, or was influenced. Our, our education was influenced by the what was called the progressive education movement in which um, learning was to be not simply, you know, rote, rote learning, memorizing and, and with the teacher as the, as the um, all knowing one, but rather that there should be learning through process, through touching things and uh, uh, through object, learning through, with objects that uh, young people and, uh, and lifelong learners would be really developing themselves. So the sense of development through the arts, right? That, that that was sort of that's what what I experienced in the 1950s, uh, where we had lots of arts in the schools and choirs and visual art and and drama and uh, not very much dance, I'm afraid, in my schools. But that is part of it as well. Um, but during somewhere around the 1980s, as I think everyone knows, well, oh, I see. Sorry, folks. That Somebody's there's something going off. It's your phone. There's something's going off in my home here. Um, sorry, there's noise going on here. Um, so, uh, so I won't go into it in great depth, except to say that that the um, progressive education movement was much closer, much more closely aligned to um, learning for well-being than, um, than the system there, the, the ideas that came in in the 1980s, especially in which um, learning or education was intended to be for um, really to provide trained and skilled workers for the workplace. That's really what we're, we're sort of industrial model of education. And um, and we think that and and the result of that has been the reduction of arts in schools, and uh, and and much more strain on art arts in the communities. It's very more difficult to find funding and so on. So to to find ourselves here at this time is wonderful. We are we have a current project which is national and involves at the present times, I think about fifteen different national organizations in Canada. Is that we're going to be promoting? We have a, an advocacy um, a project in which we're going to um, promote the idea of the arts are essential to Canada's well being. And so the arts are essential to Canada's well being. We hope that that might be useful to people in other countries as well. It doesn't have to be only Canada's well being, but this is the theme that, we're, that we've taken on. And um, uh, and it's actually being embraced with enthusiasm across the country. So 
we're only at the beginning of that, but we will be happy to provide the results that let you know what, what happens with that. I just am grateful to be in this uh, company of these wonderful colleagues and this, uh, what is I see as a movement towards seeing well-being as the ultimate goal of learning and of arts and learning. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Larry, and it's uh, so nice to have as well the perspective uh, from Canada. And now we will uh, move to Brazil. Uh, we stay in, uh, you know, in uh, in the America's uh, coast. Uh, I will give uh, the floor to Claudio Anjos uh, for uh, Lochpe Foundation and uh, on the program of continuous development programs for art teacher from public schools in uh, in Brazil. Thank you, Cla Claudio, to, to be with us uh, today. And I, the floor is yours. Many, many thanks, Isabel. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone from all over the world. I'm Claudio from the Yoshpi Foundation and also from the Art at School Institute. It is a great honor for us to be invited for such a wonderful initiative alongside with these incredible colleagues from all over the world. The Art at School Institute was created 32 years ago from a dream from our great beloved founder and first president, Ms. Evelyn Yoshpe. She truly believed that every student had the right for quality public education, and that also includes good art classes. Throughout the 12 years of basic education in Brazil, we can use the art classes to promote full citizenship, critical thinking, empathy, creativity, mental health, and innovation for all. It is also important to say that we only work with Brazilian contemporary art, most especially with the artists who are originally from the same cities and neighborhoods as the schools we work with. For we want to value the local culture and the sense of pride and belonging of those local communities. In Brazil, there are currently 570,000 art teachers at public schools, but unfortunately, only 6% of them has an actual degree in arts. So the Institute has established three main pillars of action. The first pillar is continuous professional development, as Isabel was saying. And this is directed to our teachers. Through a network of 33 universities spread out in 19 Brazilian states, where we have a specific room for our arts teachers training, we do this professional uh, continuous development. And also we do it at distance from our headquarters in Sao Paulo. In 2020, for instance, despite the pandemics, we are able to train around 58,000 teachers from all over Brazil. The second pillar of our work here in Brazil is the Art at School Award. In partnership with UNESCO, since the year 2000, we award the most innovative art teachers from all over Brazil in five different categories. The first one is early childhood education. Then we have primary education, middle education, secondary education, and adult education, which is also very important for us. Last year, for instance, in 2020, we received 1,500 projects to analyze, most of them based on social problems faced by students and teachers in their classrooms. And also we showcase how the art teachers work with the students on these topics to explore possible solutions. Then all these projects, the ones that are, they become winners, they become short documentaries from five to seven minute long. And now we have the pleasure to watch six of these documentaries with subtitles in English at the Versus exhibit that opens today. The third pillar of our work here in Brazil is related to material development for arts teachers. Since we hear the needs of these art teachers through their courses, through our classes, we also develop pedagogical material to support the art classes. We have already distributed, for instance, 160 different documentaries about contemporary Brazilian artists, 
with pedagogical material for the teachers to use in their classrooms. We have also distributed over to over 100,000 schools in Brazil an art package with 250 copies of masterpieces from key contemporary Brazilian artists with several books about the subject. Well, in a nutshell, there has been a bit of our work here in Brazil for the past 32 years, and we are very grateful for being invited to be part of this amazing group of people who believe the arts has the power to create a better world for all with more empathy, more mental health, more caring, and why not more love as well. That's all we need nowadays. Thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, Claudio, and I think it's it's incredible and it's amazing, you know, to see the scale you have reached, you know, in in Brazil, and uh, that demonstrates, you know, how we it's it's so important to connect the dots and to connect each other uh, together, and we we will do. Thank you uh, again, and now uh, I would like to introduce uh, to you Ahmed. Uh, all that from amazing uh, initiative called Lava Stage, and uh, is 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 really uh, incredible incredible energy, and he will uh, talk specifically about the concept of um, unity f uh, in terms of mural painting. Donc, he will uh, we will share uh, in this exhibit, in fact, what he have performed just now in Colombia. He will tell you more. And uh, you can see as well on uh, on on the on the um, on the space, you know, on the on the back. And uh, he will uh, tell us as well about uh, the concept of unity song. Uh, I, I love this concept; it's so powerful. And uh, I, I give uh, to him the floor now to to tell us more about Lava Stage. Thank you, Ahmed. communities and we my company Cybel Solutions uh, is a company that's focused on bringing uh, opportunities to communities worldwide whether it's a vulnerable community in a remote location a rural community or an urban community we believe that all communities have uh, natural cultural resources historical resources that sometimes go overlooked and as a result of that, a lot of these communities miss out on opportunities to, uh, to interact with investors and world markets. As a result of our work and working, the honor of working with many communities, we have discovered that, well, we didn't discover it, we, we acknowledge the fact that art is an important part of almost any community. And we believe that inclusion in art is a stimulant to be in a, to be included in other types of activities that can improve the quality of life of an individual, an individual's family, or an entire community. And we we also believe that people need to be stimulated, they need to be inspired, they need to be motivated and incentivized to create not just art, but to create situations or conditions that will ultimately improve their, their quality of life. And uh, as a company, we've always in, in involved art or entertainment into how to deliver message to a society, to a group of people. Uh, and sometimes it may not even be a motivated group of people, but through entertainment and art, uh, you can motivate people. You can get them to create and inspire things. Uh, we believe that memory is equal to the creativity. What do I mean by that? That, uh, you know, for centuries, uh, as man has been around, there's been a, a need for art. There's been a need for things to, to be expressed. And that expression, I think, comes from living and just you know, generation after generation, and these this information gets instilled in the human, 
and that eventually becomes imagination. I, it's a it's a concept that we 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 kind of live by that you what you're imagining today is part of yesterday. So with that in mind, we we believe that going forward towards any future requires understanding the memories that inspire our imagination. So with that said, uh, we we've come up with a, a, a project that we're calling the hugs movement. The hugs movement basically means health, unity, goodness, and strength. After COVID, uh, people need to be united. People need to be inspired and they need to be, you know, kind of made to feel good again. So this hugs movement, uh, it, we, we're starting it uh, through our platform called Lava Stage, which is a, it's an, an inclusive platform that allows artists of any caliber uh, to present their work and maybe get inspired or inspire others to collaborate and bring forth a project or a product, regardless of the type of art. Could be a mural, could be uh, could be a song, could be a video. Any of these things that we consider art today, uh, not necessarily years ago was considered art, but with an inclusive or collective uh, effort, we can bring people together, especially today with mediums such as Zoom and these, and these uh, virtual meetings, we can now bring people together. So our platform, Lava Stage, is doing exactly that. And what we're doing to launch Lava Stage on June 25th, as a matter of fact, is we're, we're, we're launching what we're calling the Unity Song. And the Unity Song is based on, it doesn't matter if you are an ex existing artist or you're just starting out or you just had a simple idea to write a beautiful poem and you put it up on this platform, you put it on your social media and other folks want to contribute to that song or poem, uh, somebody can contribute their, their, their vocals or their instruments. But the idea is that collaboration from different parts of the world to create one song to compete with other folks around the world and eventually pick one song that will be an anthem for a lot of the work that some of you folks do here, some of the work that we do uh, and creating that inspiration. Uh, today, uh, I wanted to also introduce one of our artists that is, is helping us in bringing some of that unity. Uh, his name is Camilo. Uh, his name is, uh, his stage name, if you will, professional name is Apollo. He's a graffiti artist out of Medellin, Colombia, extremely talented human being. Mm -hmm. And we, he's agreed to help us uh, invite other graffiti artists from around the world to join forces with him or with us to create a, a, a unity mural that kind of will support the song in a sense and uh, be able to kind of express that on a, on a global scale and, and really bring art to, to the forefront of uh, of unity so that uh, i invite everyone to to visit uh lava stage starting um just, uh june 25th for our launch and uh that's all i have for you guys right now thank you so much uh, annette for uh, this uh, fantastic energy um you bring you know uh with us and um and and thanks for uh, uh, this uh, amazing contribution and uh, now i uh, i would like to give uh, the floor uh, to our uh, fantastic guest that came from montpellier the city of montpellier in france and uh, it is uh, Deborah Ducasse, uh, she's uh, responsible from, uh, for the center, uh, I will say in French, center, Centre de Thérapie uh, des Troubles de l'Humeur uh, et, et Emotionnel. And uh, from the, uh, the CHU of, of Montpellier hein, in France. And, uh, and as well, Olivier Utero, and uh, he's a main teacher, you know, in, t in the Center of Meditation of uh, Kandapa Vajrasajva. I hope I, uh, I say well, but you will correct me. Uh, okay, I will give you the floor now and uh, up to you to, uh, to add many things, you know, to my speech. <laughs> Thank you.
Bonjour. Bom dia. Hello. My name is Olivier Hugues Terreau. I'm Canadian born, Quebecois, and I am now living in Montpellier, southern France. I am a social entrepreneur and a therapeutic clown and a qualified Kadampa Buddhist meditation teacher. I have been nominated in Brazil as an Ashoka Fellow for my work about how to communicate with people with dementia. And I'm here today to present to you two projects. First, let's be aware that an ongoing practice of therapeutic clowning working together with healthcare team has been introduced in our hospitals since 1986. And why clown? The clown figure is understood as the archetype of resiliency. Charles Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Laurel and Hardy, to name a few of the iconic silent movie clowns, always got themselves involved in the worst situations, but always got back on their feet at the end as if nothing happened. Why is this so? Because the clown is the artist of failure. And living in a healthy way with our own failures is proof of our resiliency. Helping a child with the failure that hospitalization might represent is crucial. And the clown has a very, very unique way of doing this. As the clown might be the only person who shows up not to help, but to ask for the child's help. Initially, Therapeutic cloning was especially dedicated to pediatric care, but you will discover as part of this exhibition, healthcare clowns, social clowns, therapeutic clowns, medical clowns, clowns without borders, and more in hospital settings, seniors' residencies, refugee camps, and so on. An incredible worldwide movement that the World Health Organization wanted to celebrate as an amazing, resilient, human response. But what could we learn from this? Two important concepts are working together in healthcare, valuing quantity of life and valuing quality of life. But quantity, quantity of life is easily well quantified. What would qualify for quality of life? Research is showing that to say that <clears throat> our life as quality. Whatever the circumstances, we all need to feel that we are resilient beings, we are compassionate beings, and we are creative beings. For example, someone with dementia is quickly considered as no longer resilient, for whom we must do everything. And so, who can no longer participate creatively to the well being of his or her environment? We no longer ask for support from this person. And so, he or she will naturally shut down as that person has lost his or her quality of life. However, research again proves that people who are identifying themselves as resilient, compassionate, and creative can have developed dementia but are not limited by its symptoms if they're both supported and challenged as so they have been seen as recovering cognitive faculties such as speech and memory while caring for others how do we help them develop quality of life shouldn't we start by considering them ourselves as resilient, compassionate, and creative beings, then the most effective way to demonstrate it is simply, simply by asking them for their help for us. Like this, we show them that we are vulnerable too, and that we trust them, and that we need them, and that they do help us to change for the better? Do we have the courage to be vulnerable enough to put ourselves in such a position where while caring for them, we ask them to care also for us? 
Such healthy vulnerability is an essential skill to be developed if we want to build resiliency, compassion, and creativity for ourselves, but even more to surround ourselves by such people. As the art of failing and quality of life go hand in hand, because without failing, how do we know we are truly resilient and that we haven't just been lucky? Without failing, how do we know we are truly compassionate and that we're not just helping others to boost our ego? Without failing, how do we know we are truly creative, that we have actually tried something new, that we're not just, in fact, repeating ourselves without knowing it? We are all confronted with failures from birth to death. Instead of being perceived as what prevents us from the quality of life we all so much desire, failures can become our best friends if we want to develop actual quality of life. We need the courage to stop acting like we are isolated islands, overprotecting ourselves, and learn to ask for help as the resilient, compassionate, and creative beings that we all already are. This has been proven to be the core of collaborative leadership. When we realize that we actually need the help of all the parties involved and that they need ours, but as the resilient, compassionate and creative beings that we all are. We're not just talking about healthcare here, but also about education, workplace, diplomacy, social security, raising a family, and so on. As an Ashoka social entrepreneur, I've been teaching this in so many cultures and contexts. For example, in Brazil, I brought executives into a senior's residence to develop their collaborative leadership skills to learning to ask for support from the patients with dementia. However, I understood that this process of identifying with our resilient compassionate and creative capacities to a greater scale. Something more direct and universal is at hand, turning towards what is actually making us resilient, compassionate and creative beings. Simply the way our own mind works. And each of us can learn how to learn from his or own her own mind. It's a universal process called meditation. What do we do essentially in meditation? We are changing our mindset about who we are. And so about what we can and then what we need to do. We deeply change our inner narrative as we are identifying ourselves and others as being interdependent, resilient, compassionate and creative people. For example, through meditation, we can simply observe and realize that our mind can never be broken by the experience of pain. So we are all resilient. There's nothing more empowering than the experience of caring for the well-being of others. So we are all compassionate. Our mind creates all our experiences. So. We are all creative. While the limited self we normally identify with is perceived as fixed and like the center of the universe. But if we look for it, we can see that it does not exist. We can all stop and perceive that the basis of our sense of self is actually changing all the time. So a fixed limiting self does not exist. Therefore, we are all free, free to rethink ourselves based from now on, on the resilient, compassionate and creative qualities of our mind. And this brings us to our second topic. Now in Montpellier, the Kadampa Meditation Center, where I act as a resident teacher, has developed a partnership with the local university hospital to deliver medical meditation protocols to patients diagnosed 
with mood and emotion disorders, such as bipolar, depression, and borderline personality disorder. Results are astonishing. Over time, the patients are no longer feel limited by their disorders, as they can see that it does not impair the challenge of becoming resilient, compassionate, and creative beings. For example, a female diagnosed with borderline personality disorder decided to give this program a try. She has been desperate for years to find something that would allow her to really manage her life while struggling with such emotional intensity. Because borderline disorder is exhausting, as the smallest human interaction could trigger an excruciating emotional response of abandonment. It is exhausting and impairing. Over the long term, it may lead to depression and sadly, suicide. Depression and suicide, as we all know now, is no longer a rarity. According to the WHO, depression became one of the most prevalent mental health problems of the 21st century and number one cause of disability. Number one. While there are now more people on this planet dying by suicide than by homicide, while the self that we normally see does not exist. Across countries, mood disorders such as depression and emotional disorders such as anxiety have been two to three times higher during this COVID-19 period. All of us have been hit by this pandemic devastating effect on our mood and emotions. For the first time in human history, three billion people were confined at the same time. We all lived through it, each one of us. We all have been worrying, were downcast sometimes, stayed awake at night. Well, for all of us too, the self that we normally see does not exist. The WHO's general director advised us in March to prepare for a significant mental trauma for years to come after the pandemic ends. He said to quote directly, it means mass trauma, which exceeds any proportion, even more severe than what the world experienced after World War II. Countries must see it and prepare for it, and the WHO will support mental health in every way possible. But would we try to heal a self that does not exist? To speak now about mental health and meditation, I want to present to you Dr. Deborah Ducas, psychiatrist, researcher, writer, and head of the Center for Mood and Emotional Disorder Therapies at of the University Hospital Center of Montpellier. We were so lucky that it was right at the beginning of the pandemic that we started a new pilot project in third wave cognitive and behavioral therapy, also called Buddhist-derived practices, whose effectiveness is becoming more widely documented. Dr. Ducasse has just published for the American National Alliance on Mental Illness. It is our belief that borderline personality disorder acts as a magnifying glass of ordinary human functioning based on a fundamental error, self-identification, as is defined in Buddhist psychology, self-grasping ignorance. What is this mistaken self-identification and what are its consequences? Normally, when we think about ourselves, our sense of self is based on a sense of inherent separation. We all see ourselves as independent islands. This sense of separation leads to an experience of distress as we feel we are in here, while the so desired experiences of satisfaction, security, and value would be out there. But as an inherently independent self does not exist, this dysfunctional self-representation leads only to constant dissatisfaction, nourishing an uncontrolled sense of neediness, limitation, even hopelessness, resulting in the belief that self-centeredness must come first. However, 
through an acute observation of our own mind, we are only experiencing the opposite. It is closer to the truth to picture ourselves as a self in the vast body of life, distinct yet intimately bound up with all living beings. We cannot exist without others, and they in turn are affected by everything we do. This is a quote from Kadampa Buddhist meditation expert, Geshe Kelsang Gyatso, on whose meditative exercises we base our pilot project. Back to our case study patient. She discovered through her own experience, through her own thorough observation in her own mind, that the self she normally sees simply does not exist. And that, she stated, that was the missing key. All these years, she was trying to deal with an impaired self, to repair an impaired self, to look for therapies for an impaired self, while the self she was referring to does not exist. In the Journal of Affective Disorders, Professor Van Gordon from the University of Derby and our team reached the conclusion that one should realize that if the understanding of self-concept is impaired, all the interventions implemented to decrease the self-suffering will be subsequently impaired. The patient, through daily meditation exercises while in lockdown, finally stopped on her own to consume drugs and alcohol and stopped feeling addicted to relationships. We all need to investigate if the idea we have about ourselves is correct. Perhaps we actually live in an insatiable misrepresentation. Buddhist derived psychotherapies through the practice of meditation are aimed at moving the self-identification away from the illusion of a limited suffering self-centered self and towards the potential for an all-resilient, compassionate, and creative capacity. Based on such results, this pilot project gave birth to a university chair created this year by the University of Montpellier Foundation. Such a chair will allow us to further unite the modern approach of cognitive and behavioral therapies with the millennia-old therapeutic knowledge transmitted through Buddhism. It is the purpose of the new Kadampa Tradition School of Buddhism to transmit this correct self-identification in a way that can be integrated into our modern daily life, which is why we believe them to be a necessary partner for such a field of research. Through this chair, public mental health workers around the world can be trained online in these third wave CBT Buddhist derived practices. While Kadampa meditation centers can also be found around the world to function as resource centers to maintain and ensure such applications remain precise. This precision is to assure the efficiency in each step of this therapeutic process while in the secular context of public mental health care. Especially now, as the post pandemic era is at our doorstep. Before the predicted severe mass trauma takes hold of our mental health, this new chair will want to join the collaborative effort, offering the possibility to ask, do we really want to invest in trying to heal a self that does not exist? Or do we want to heal by identifying ourselves correctly to this amazing, resilient, compassionate, and creative potential that makes our lives worth living, not despite of all its failures. Thank you Thank very you much. much.
Th thank you so much, um, Deborah and Olivier, for this amazing, uh, extraordinary, you know, uh, I will say, unique uh, presentation. And uh, it's such a pleasure to have um, the both of you uh, with us today. And uh, what you are doing, it's so important, you know, and what you have described, it's uh, critical and it is a way we, we need to look, uh, as you have mentioned so well, this post era, you know, of, uh, I will say, not just one trauma, but <laughs> also trauma need to address uh, carefully. And uh, we, you have demonstrated and, and we have seen over the world, you know, the solution are here. They, they are here and, and they need to be connected. And uh, it's such a, um, a great pleasure. Uh, thank you again for uh, your so valuable contribution today. And uh, now I will uh, give you the floor uh, to Monica Cullen. Thank you so much to be uh, with us, Monica. And she's co-founder and chief executive officer um, in Red Nose Clune Doctors International. Thank you so much, Monica, to be with us and to uh, tell more, uh, to tell you, um, to tell us, sorry, more about this initiative. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Olivier, you already said a lot about clowning, so everybody will understand what I'm now telling them a little bit uh, from the other side. Imagine, we are in a hospital. It's a quiet, antiseptic, white ward, and we enter a room and two patients, male, Elderly, but not old, are lying there. Their eyes are closed. Their body functions are connected to a monitor. All of a sudden, these quiet curves on the monitor start jumping up wildly. The alarm clocks shrill, the doctors come in, the nurses come in. What has happened? Patients are lying there unmoved silent, only the heart is racing. We are in a coma station. And what has happened? There was the sound of ukulele on the corridor and a red noses clown sneaks into the room. And good morning, gentlemen, he said cheeringly. Today, I bring you two beautiful ladies. This is the power of the art of clowning. And imagine, we are in a geriatric ward. There is this atmosphere of sadness, of loneliness, of hopelessness. No one talks. Old, sick people are partly in bed. Mrs. Mayers is sitting on a chair, hunched over, half asleep. Then we hear chatter, we hear laughter, we hear um, songs and singing, and here the clowns are here. So faces brighten up a bit, and uh, the clowns come in, they're greeting heartily and noisily all the patients, um, they are making compliments, they're kissing hands, uh, they, are, uh, they want to compete, who's getting more attention. Uh, and at the end, they finally find together to sing a song. They sing a song which was famous some 50 years ago. And then, all of a sudden, Mrs. Mayers, she moves, she gets up. And with a shining face and with a thin voice, but with full heart, she's singing the song with the clowns. And through her shining smile, you see and you can feel the once beautiful young girl who loved to, to think, to sing. This is the miracle of the art of clowning. And imagine once again, 
we are in the surgical ward. Little Mary is in the preparation for a heart surgery. Her parents are next to her, hardly being able to suppress their fear and anxiousness and nervousness. A clown comes in, being curious, what is happening here? And then he sees little Mary. Oh, there's this beautiful little princess. And the girl smiles shyly. The parents look up, a bit relieved. And here is the prince for the princess. And he starts courting her, and he starts bowing to her, and he sings for her, and he dances for her. And she, she is the sleeping beauty. And they joke about the fairy who will come and make her sleep. But the prince, he promises he will be with her, and he will certainly wake her up again. So smiling and beaming, the little girl is rolled into the operation theater. The clown keeps holding her hand until she's fast asleep. And the parents stay outside with tears in their eyes and a smile on their face. This is the magic of the art of clowning. Ladies and gentlemen, you have already talked so much about it, but uh, uh, Humor and laughter, already Sigmund Freud once said, is an indispensable part of living. If laughter and smiles disappears, it's also life who is fading. And we can see this in hospital very often. And the clowns are there to keep the laughter, keep the smile alive. And humor and laughter is especially needed in times of pain and despair, in times of uh, hopelessness and in times of uh, desperation. And humor and laughter, it gives relief and resilience, as you said. It gives hope, it gives happiness, and it gives the strength to continue the fight. Of course, Red Nose's clowns and most of the other clowns are not just simple entertainers. They are very skilled performers. Uh, they are skilled artists. And they're trained specifically to work with sick uh, children and geriatric patients, with seniors, with rehabilitation and uh, dementia patients, also, as you said. <laughs> and uh, uh, our clowns also work a lot with traumatized refugees and with, uh, with um, uh, victims of natural disasters. And as you also said, there is a lot of studies and um, evaluation reports going on to really confirm the impact of humor and laughter on health and the psychosocial well-being of patients and of the people after all. And I think with all our heart, we can ask in, for our patients that in a modern nowadays hospital, clown care has to be a valid part of the hospital routine. And you asked me, uh, Isabel asked me to, to look what can we learn uh, from the figure of the clown for um, authentic leadership. So what can we learn? The clown is vulnerable and strong at the same time. The clown communicates honestly and he shows his emotion. The clown encounters difficulties and failures and uh, obstacles, but he is really determined to find a solution. He uses all his creativity and passion to follow his mission and to bring whatever endeavor it is to bring it to a successful end. So let us learn for the clowns, not only for leader leadership, but for all of us. Let us be guided by the clowns to bring also our own missions uh, and our humor and our human empathy to the people in need of joy. And it will be a healthier world. It will be a happier world. And it will be a more beautiful world. Come with us 
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Monica. I think the final words are everything. <laughs> and we will join you, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> you have seen, uh, we are uh, all from over the world, you know, and uh, yeah, we, it's like a dance, huh? it's like a big movement, and it's so beautiful to see. And uh, thank you again uh, for your presence, you know, and, and, uh, and this uh, energy. Uh, you bring uh, here in, in the Palais. Thank you so much. And I will um, now, uh, we will finish this uh, extraordinary uh, round table uh, with um, amazing uh, as well um, uh, person. I, I met, um, you know, uh, Mark not, not so, so long time ago. Don't it's, uh, it's so, um, Touchy for me to have all of you because we 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 were in touch not uh, not so long time. But um, I would like to introduce uh, Mark uh, Schleppi. Uh, he's uh, he's coming from uh, Saint Gall, uh, and he will talk about uh, the importance uh, and and that is so as well a key topic for me. It, it will uh, talk about the integrative medicine, you know, and uh, integrative design in fact, of health services, uh, but not just that, but as well the, the impact of uh, art, for example, and art therapy uh, in this model of uh, integrative medicine. Uh, thank you so much, Mark, uh, to be uh, with us today, and uh, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Isabel, for this kind invitation. It was really very inspiring to, to hear all those presentations. And uh, I made some notice, and I'm really amazed uh, by this clowning story, I must say. Uh, cloning is an artist of failure, a figure of resilience. I think this is incredible. Our Claudio Brazil. Art has the power to create a better world, and why not to allow more love? I really like to I picture some highlights. You did people are the experts of their own lives. Great. Veronica, activity to revitalize the soul. That's great also. But I could uh, make more citations and the incredible uh, British people. They have a National Academy for Social Prescribing. This is very inspiring. So, uh, German author and poet, and also physician Friedrich Schiller. Uh, this was the time of uh, the French Revolution. You know, brotherhood freedom, uh, equality. French people were asking themselves how society must be changed that this could happen. But there were a lot of wars and, uh, you know, guillotine, and this was not also a very uh, a happy world. And Schiller was asking himself, what have the people to do themselves? What has the individual to do that that could happen? And he had, uh, you know, Friedrich Schiller was also the author of uh, our Swiss freedom fighter, Wilhelm Tell. And he differentiates on his book, Aesthetic Education of Man, two main drives in human. The sense drive or the nature drive and the form or reason drive. If the sense or nature drive, you know, predominates, predominates, uh, then people become wild. So it's a wild society, chaotic. If the pure reason drive wins, the form drive, people become barbaric. A society uh, driven by
by intellect, statistics and theories becomes a barbaric civilization. The art of human living is the integration of both drives, actually. Form and sense drive. And Schiller was asking himself, how is this possible? How can be opened the way to the head, through the heart? Schiller's answer was through the education of emotion, of aesthetic feelings, of the sense for beauty. How is this possible? His answer was through the arts. This is not only recreational or a nice thing. This is a society mission of arts for Schiller. I am Mark Schleppi. I'm the head of the Center for Integrative Medicine at the Cantonal Hospital St. Gallen. This is the biggest academic hospital in Eastern Switzerland. Uh, there are 6,000 6, people working there and uh, we run an integrative medicine with different uh, complementary medicine directions. We have a mind-body medicine program, mindfulness-based stress reduction. This was taken from Buddhism actually, Zen Buddhism. Uh, we have anthroposophic medicine, arts therapies, eurythmy therapy. We have Chinese medicine, especially acupuncture and osteopathy. We have up about 10,000 patient contacts a year. And uh, so we see uh, more patients with chronic diseases like cancer, chronic pain, neurologic problems. Also children come more and more to our hospital, referred by the, the, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Switzerland. 70 to 80 percent of our patients are outpatient, 20 to 30 patient, uh, percent of the patients are inpatient. We see those patients in all the wards of the, the hospital and, uh, and treat them together with the other specialists. And we have also a concept, I don't want to tell in, in detail, but it's a concept A, B and C. A is we make everything from the people from the Center for Integrative Medicine. B is when the wards, for example, oncology or rheumatology uh, uh, or neurology wards are trained. The nurses are trained by external applications, etc. So nursing interventions. And C is when the physician is also trained on the ward. So he has a double uh, specialization, complementary medicine and for example, neurology or oncology. We are also uh, running uh, studies to, now we have two randomized controlled trials, one in urethmia therapy and cancer-related fatigue, and one in chemotherapy-induced dyskoisia. I come to the end and I come to Schiller again. I wanted to tell you that because of the clowning, I was it's interesting. I told you about those two sense drive, you no, know, and the form drive. So the form drive, reasoning, intellectual, everything is clear and uh, unity, and the sense drive with emotion, feelings, and uh, yeah cows maybe, and Schiller brought a third drive, which is in relation to beauty and art, which allows form and sense drive to meet, to unite and promotes full free personal development. He names it the play drive. And in uh, this, uh, this book was this citation, which I finish with that citation. Man only, only plays when he is in the fullest sense of the world a human being. And he is only fully a human being when he plays. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, uh, Mark, for this uh, amazing uh, presentation. And uh, I think it's uh, perfect <laughs> for the final words, uh, you know, to resume uh, this amazing uh, roundtable. Uh, it was uh, incredible to see so many initi initiatives because it was a little bit, you know, the purpose of this roundtable to, to show, you know, uh, over the world, you know, in each country, uh, what it is possible, you know, how it is uh, driven, uh, and, and specifically uh, for me, it was to um, to bring people together, to, to connect to each other, and, and to uh, to do co-creation together. And for uh, for that, we uh, we will create an account uh, for each of you uh, for our digital platform because we have uh, been able to. Uh, set up a beautiful um, digital platform and I would like to thank uh, the extraordinary team uh, with me have done this uh, incredible work and uh, thank you to Ronan uh, Delil and, uh, and his wife uh, uh, Sophie. <laughs> thank you so much to be uh, with us and uh, I would like to, I would like to thank to thanks as well uh, Child because he, he was uh, our uh, main musician uh, to um, to describe you know in music and with uh, all this testimony you you have you, you see all these artists and you have done a just incredible performance because you have totally uh, created from the, the, the scratch <laughs> the melody uh, to adapt to each culture of uh, of this artist uh, you can see here and uh, look you will you will be able uh, to uh, hear the music and as well to uh, to have the the text in a in vocal way uh, through the, the different screen uh, and we have as well other beautiful uh, testimony uh, and i would like to thank uh, him uh, a lot as well and it is an expression you know uh, as well of uh, the concept of what we call art fusion, you know, don't we have demonstrated with the 3D printing, for example, how the prothesis, you know, when they, they are done, you know, they are not artistic, they are not, you know, really beautiful, you know, and it's very difficult sometimes to, uh, to have that part of you, you know, every day, look, it's, but you can put art, you know, now with as well with uh, the benefit of the technology, look, we can create you know, this uh, art fusion for the best and uh, to create more beauty, you know, uh, including if we have, uh, as you have uh, described, uh, any uh, health issue, you know, or health condition. And uh, I think the, the fact we can, uh, we can have the courage to be first ourselves and to share with each other, it's, uh, it's um, I think, the best uh, gift, gift. And uh, to, to finish uh, this session, uh, because it was very long, uh, you know, uh, as well in terms of timing. So thank you for your patience as well. That <laughs> uh, I hope you have enjoyed. I, will, I, I would like to invite you for just maybe five minutes of meditation together because we have created a special uh, room, uh, you know, uh, with this um, incredible, you know, display as well. I've been, uh, I've been, um, Great by uh, my friend Aiko is here, and uh, I would like to, to just invite you with your mask uh, to join us to see this, uh, this room and just to, to meditate three minutes to relax, you know, after this <laughs> long, uh, uh, you know, uh, series of uh, presentation. But thank you so much again to, to all of you for uh, your presence and your uh, incredible commitment to well-being and health for all. Thank you. <laughs>